of the little Canadian homes, the official publication of the bootmakers of Toronto. Um, his wife, Joanne, joined us back in November, gave, uh, earlier this year, back in January. She spoke on the ghost ship and Arthur Conan Doyle. So we now will introduce Mark Alperset with Arthur Conan Doyle and baseball. Mark, the floor is yours. Thanks, Greg. I'll uh, get the screen sharing here. Uh, how's that? Everybody see the first slide? Uh, okay. Um, all right. Well, I, I crashed once today during this meeting, so hopefully the computer will be fine and uh, I won't crash again. If I do, I'll try to be back as soon as possible. Um, I'm currently blaming the uh, nanobots I got from my va vaccination from Bill Gates. Um, so Arthur Conan Doyle and baseball, an unlikely duo. Uh, this is a surprising topic for, for some. When I stumbled across the topic in 2015, I suggested an article on it to Steve Rothman, the editor of the Baker Street Journal. And we both agreed it would be a good topic, albeit a short one. By the time the article was published and a lot of research was done, uh, it was published in the summer of 2016. The article came in around 4,000 words and it could have been longer. Many of us know Conan Doyle as a keen sportsman when I interviewed Dame Jean uh, in the 90s, uh, she wanted uh, one thing to be clear about her father and his sports. She wanted to know that he was an all-rounder. He, he loved all sports. Billiards, cricket, soccer, skiing, rugby, uh, boxing, the list goes on and on. He was a keen sportsman and a real competitor. I think we have to realize that when we read his stories, we have to realize he was a competitor through and through. Today, this little talk will be just focusing on the great American pastime of baseball and not a sport often associated with Conan Doyle. So here we are. Uh, this is the first, uh, one of the first pictures we have of Conan Doyle. We see him in a posed picture in his cricketing whites. He is 14 in this picture. He would have been at Stonyhurst and enjoying several sports, including something called Stonyhurst Cricket. Uh, for more information on uh, Conan Doyle and cricket, you can read my 2018 article on the topic in the Baker Street Journal. Arthur Conan Doyle was a very good cricketer. There's no, no, no question about that. He played in hundreds of matches throughout his life, including several first-class matches. If you go through Brian Pugh's um, chronology and you look at uh, during his active life, he was always playing cricket. There was one match you know, a week on the weekends. He was playing two matches. He was always, always involved in cricket in one way or another. Uh, this 14-year-old that we picture here uh, grew up, obviously, to become one of the world's finest authors, and he toured the world. And when he was on tour, he was often taking in the local culture and events wherever he was. So, he made, uh, Conan Doyle made three trips to North America. Uh, and during those trips, he had a few brushes with baseball, both amateur and professional. On May 27th, 1914, uh, Conan Doyle and his wife arrived in New York. Three days later, the pair were seated at New York. And I know we're talking about New York, again, New York and baseball. New York's fabled baseball stadium, the Polo Grounds, to see the second half of a doubleheader between the visiting Philadelphia Athletics and the mighty New York Yankees. That's for, that's for Jerry. In, in, in those days, uh, the games of a doubleheader were hours apart. In the first game, Philadelphia defeated the New York Yankees 8-0. In the evening game, the Yankee backs woke up and surged back, and they, will, they won 10-5. This, uh, as, we, as we believe, this is Conan Doyle's first uh, ball game that he, uh, that he watched. In his book, Memories and Adventures, Conan Doyle recalls the game by stating it was, quote, a first class match, as we should say, or some ball, as a native expert described it. I looked on it with all the critical but sympathetic eyes of an experienced, though decrepit, cricketer, end quote. What we have pictured here 
is the 1914 New York Yankees and the 1914 Philadelphia Athletics. And a clipping uh, from a uh, New York State uh, uh, newspaper showing the morning game where Philadelphia beat New York 8 nothing, as I stated, and the afternoon game of uh, New York beating uh, Philadelphia 10-5. to After a little time in uh, New York, uh, including a trip to Sing Sing, which he uh, visited just before the ballgame. Uh, they took a train to Montreal, and the Conradors took a, a special train, uh, travel west across Canada to Jasper, Alberta, in a special rail car that was built, uh, made for them, available for them by the CPR. And they, uh, the tour was sponsored by the railway. Uh, this map is from ArthurConanDoyle.com, and I thank them for it because it saved me a lot of time. So they, they, as you can see from the, the red line, they, they cross Canada, it's a big trip, across to Jasper. And here we go. Here is Jasper, Alberta in 1914. Uh, it's a, I was telling Greg, it's not a one horse town because there's actually four horses in this picture. So it might've been a four horse town at the time. Uh, at the time it was an important but growing town. Uh, the Doyles stayed here from June 11th to June 19th, and they rested and relaxed in the fresh air of Jasper National Park, which had been established only seven years previously. It was here in Jasper that we get the picture which Greg used to promote the, this talk, and we often see pictures when we're talking about Conan Doyle in sports or Conan Doyle in baseball. Um, the exact date of this game in question uh, just like the dates in the Sherlock Holmes story, they're, they're, um, they're to be interpreted, we'll say. Both Conan Doyle and Lady Conan Doyle kept diaries during this trip, but neither of them agree on the date of the game. Uh, they obviously had lost track of it. However, it was a match between Jasper and the team from Edson, Alberta, a town of about 100 miles east. Uh, from the picture, you can see there Conan Doyle is, was asked to... Uh, hit the ceremonial first pitch. You can see he's in his tie, he took off his jacket, his uh, pants are tucked into his socks. And over on the left, we can see a buggy with uh, a couple spectators. Uh, the, one of them is probably Lady Conan Doyle. There's other spectators there, but uh, it, it's very likely she is under the parasol. Uh, Doyle later wrote of this match and him being asked to uh, uh, hit the first pitch, he wrote, the pitcher, fortunately, was merciful and the ball came swift but true. I steadied myself by trying to imagine that it was a cricket bat which I held in my grasp and that it was a full toss which asked to be hit over the ropes. Fortunately, I got, a, I got it fairly in the middle and it went on its pointed way, whizzing past the ear of a photographer who expected me to pat it. I should not care to have to duplicate that performance. So the final score for those who are keeping tally of the games was Ed, Edson 20, Jasper 16. Uh, we don't know uh, if anybody scored on uh, Doyle's first, first hit there. So we, we've already mentioned Conan Doyle's uh, first, first brush with baseball. Uh, surprisingly, though, it, his actually first brush with baseball was in 1899, years before he visited America. A visiting American author, Hamlin Garland, demonstrated the curveball to him, to Conan Doyle at, at Doyle's home in Hindhead. Uh, the story is recounted in Garland's memoir, as shown here, Roadside Meetings. Garland at the time was a celebrated American novelist, poet, essayist, and short story writer. He is best known for his fiction involving hardworking Midwestern farmers, although Garland is more or less forgotten today. Garland was a friend of George Bernard Shaw. Shaw and Doyle were, were neighbors. And uh, Garland was staying with Shaw, and the two of them went out to meet Conan Doyle one day. Garland spoke to Doyle of the merits of baseball and mentioned the curveball to him, and Doyle doted that a ball could actually be thrown to curve midair. Uh, remember, this is 1899. Garland was a former pitcher as well as a, a novelist, 
And he said he would prove it to Doyle if Doyle had a baseball. Doyle replied, I don't suppose there is a baseball in all of England. Would a cricket do? Cricket ball do? Well, anybody who's picked up a cricket ball versus a baseball would know that they, they are not the same. Uh, cricket balls are heavier, they're uh, a bit bigger, uh, the seams are different completely. However, Garland was a, an experienced pitcher. He looked at the, the cricket ball and said, well, let's give it a shot. Garland then proceeded to throw a few curveballs to a coach in Conan Doyle who was catching with his bare hands. He, he didn't have a, a, a catcher's glove or a baseball glove of any sort. So he thought he'd just catch them with his bare hands. Oh. On the final pitch, Garland said he was going to put some heat on it as well as a curve. Uh, as the ball came in, Doyle sidestepped the pitch, letting the ball go into a net behind him. In 1891, Garland was on a speaking tour of his own. Um, and, or, or, sorry, a few years later, after this, Garland was on a, a speaking tour of the U.S. And one of the topics he spoke on was teaching Conan Doyle to pitch a baseball. Conan Doyle's second trip to North America, eight years after his first, landed him once again in New York City. This time arriving on the 9th of April, 1922, this time he had his wife and three children. In his book, Our American Adventure, Doyle wrote, Mr. Kedick, who is Lee Kedick, the agent who organized Conan Doyle's lecture tour, introduced a touch of sport into our lives by taking us all to see the opening game, opening ball game of the season where we rooted for the Giants who are our famous New York team. The match was against Brooklyn who made a very poor show, though on their day they are, I understand, quite a good team. The opening uh, game of that season was on the 12th of April. Uh, so literally uh, just a couple days after they landed in, in uh, New York, the Brooklyn Robins, best known as the Dodgers then, uh, and now, uh, however, defeated the Giants in that game by a score of four to three. During my uh, research for this talk, I also discovered another baseball game uh, Conan Doyle attended, which has thus far gone unreported. So this group of uh, Sherlockians and Doyleans right now are hearing for the first time about another ball game that Conan Doyle uh, went to. Uh, it, it's in none of the biographies or chronologies, and it's in uh, none of uh, Conan Doyle's notes, although the, the New York Herald reported it. Uh, the game was at the Polo Grounds again, his second trip to the Polo Grounds, and it was on April 15th, and he saw the Giants hum humiliate the Dodgers by a 17-10 to 10 score. Uh, the, the article you're seeing here actually says that uh, it was uh, Conan Doyle's first uh, time at the Polo Grounds, but uh, any, anyone who's listening now knows it was actually his second time, but it was a, a little bit of a brand new research just for this uh, presentation. Conan Doyle's third and final trip to North America was in 1923. This was a four month trip and it took Conan Doyle and his family to New York, from New York to Los Angeles, and from there across the continent to Montreal with many stops and lectures on spiritualism in between. The Conan Doyle party arrived in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is kind of center top of the screen. You can kind of see Winnipeg there in Manitoba. Uh, they arrived on Sunday, the 1st of July. The next day was Dominion Day, a national holiday commemorating the formation of Canada as a country on the 1st of July, 1867. Uh, the holiday was renamed Canada Day in 1982. Conan Doyle wrote of this uh, event uh, arriving in Winnipeg, we came upon it on Dominion Day when all business was suspended and everyone was in festivity. So we fitted ourselves into the picture and attended an international baseball match between Winnipeg and Minneapolis in the morning. Both sides seemed to be surprisingly good, and the fielding, catching, and throwing in were far superior to that of good old English cricket teams. So the match was played at Wesley Park between the Winnipeg Arenas and the Minneapolis All-Stars. Sadly, the home team lost by a score of 13 to 6. However, Wesley Park holds its own place in baseball history 
uh, in addition to being one of the places Conan Doyle saw yeah. a baseball game, uh, <laughs> for baseball history, it, it hosted the first night game in May 1932, three years before the first major league night game. So far, we have looked at uh, games that Conan Doyle either saw or even played in. However, we also know from his own writings that he enjoyed the sport. He, he didn't only uh, take part, uh, he enjoyed it. In a, his series of articles titled Western Wanderings, he wrote of baseball, the men, <laughs> uh, only Conan Doyle, the men were fine fellows, harder looking than most of our professionals. Indeed, they train continually, and some of the teams have to practice complete abstinence, which is said to show its good results, not so much in physical fitness as in mental quickness, which is very essential for the game. The catching seemed to be extraordinarily good, especially the judging of long catches by the bleachers, as the old field, as the old fields, who are far from any shade are called. The throwing in is also remarkably hard and accurate, and if applied to cricket, would astonish some of our batsmen. All right, um, here we have a picture of ACD and his three children from his second marriage. Jean is the, uh, the little girl there on, on, on the left, uh, wearing glasses. And it is believed the picture was taken during the 1922 trip across America. The other adult in the picture is not identified, although I think it is Lee Kedick, uh, the promoter of the, uh, of the tour. As you can see, all three kids are in some form uh, with baseball. Uh, mentioned uh, Gene there on the left uh, with the baseball bat. The middle boy is obviously dressed as a catcher. And on the right, uh, he's also wearing a little baseball hat and uh, he has the ball. Unfortunately, uh, there are no home movies of the, the family playing baseball. There, there's a few home movies of Conan Doyle. There's one even of him taking a few practice golf swings. Um, and Conan Doyle did report that his children uh, took, to the, took to the game. He, Lee Kedick, has started with a baseball set and they are, are already fans, rooters, and every other word for enthusiasts. Today, they came back from a, uh, a game, The Shining Joy. Uh, so unfortunately, as, as I mentioned, there's no um, moving pictures of them. Of them. So I, I created this instead with uh, little Jean. She knows the score. She's ready. She says, okay, take the picture. Come on, come on. Let's go play some ball. So Conan Doyle mentioned in one of his articles that uh, his children got to, uh, got a fair bit of joy of meeting Alexander, a famous pitcher who had given each of them a ball and they had photographed taking, uh, holding his hand. What we have here is that picture. Uh, the picture, the picture in, uh, in question that Conan Doyle called Alexander is Grover Cleveland Alexander. He played from 1911 to 1930 for the Philadelphia Phillies, Chicago Cubs, and St. Louis Cardinals, and is, is one of a, a handful of truly, truly famous, famous pictures. Um, the picture you're seeing here is also new to Sherlockians and Doyleans. Uh, it was, uh, I found it when uh, I was doing research for this, uh, this talk. And um, it, it was basically unknown until I, I found it again from, a, from an old, old newspaper clipping of the day. Uh, so the two boys, and if you look at other pictures from uh, Conan Doyle's trip, you can see the boys are kind of constantly dressed in this uh, kind of schoolboy outfit. Uh, so this is from 1922. So Conan, Conan Doyle wrote, baseball is a novel game. I enjoy watching it immensely. I know baseball is the game England needs. For years, there has been a demand for a young man's game and baseball will fill the want. Conan Doyle went on to say, my sons, Dennis and Malcolm, are baseball fans, and I know they are going to teach all their young friends how to play. When reminiscing about the game uh, that he opened with uh, from the picture here, 
in the, the, when he hit the single in Jasper uh, and baseball in general, Conan Doyle wrote, I wish more and more that this game would acclimatize to Britain, for it has many points which make it the ideal game for both players and spectators. I have all the prejudice of an old cricketer, and yet I cannot get away from the fact that baseball is a better game. These are strong words from such an accomplished cricketer. Never one to hide his thoughts or opinions, Conan Doyle wrote to the Times in late October 1925. What is essential is that here is a splendid game, baseball, which calls for fine eye, activity, bodily fitness, and judgment in the highest degree. The game needs no expensive leveling of a field. Its outfits are, are within reach of any village club. It takes only two or three hours in playing. It is independent of wet wickets, and the player is on his toes all of the time and not sitting on a pavilion bench while another man scores his century. If it were taken up by our different association teams as a summer pastime, I believe it would sweep this country as it has done America. At the same time, it would no more interfere with cricket than lawn tennis has done. It would find its own place. Conan Doyle's good thoughts on baseball uh, didn't quite come about. Uh, today, there are about 40 adult and junior baseball teams throughout Great Britain. There's probably more teams in Baltimore alone. A far cry from the popularity that Conan Doyle envisaged. But those teams and hundreds of players who enjoy the American summer game in the UK may owe a debt of gratitude to Conan Doyle's own love for the game, maybe even back to the 1914 game in Jasper, Alberta, where he opened with such a fine hit. I think I'll, I'll finish off uh, before we get to the question part with a, with a couple real oddities uh, from Conan Doyle and baseball. Here we have a clipping uh, that I came across while researching. We have an American high school baseball pitcher by the name of A. Conan Doyle. The year is 1921 and we are in Boston. A. Count Conan Doyle was a team captain. In the article, the boy's mother claims her son was named after their famous cousin and author. I have checked with the Doyle estate and they have no idea who this family is and they are not related. So it may have just been some uh, uh, American grifters trying to uh, hone in on their, uh, their, their last name. Uh, and uh, A. Conan Doyle didn't go on to play uh, professional ball, he was a high school player, nothing more. And another oddity related to this, uh, this topic is this Sherlock -o the Monk cartoon that appeared in the St. Louis Star on May 3rd, 1911. Uh, the, the writing's false, so I'll read it to you. The, the gist of the cartoon is that a, the local baseball club ma manager comes to Sherlock and Watson saying the clubhouse has been robbed of all their bats. They track down the culprit to a neighbor of the ballpark who is tired of having his windows broken. It's not the funniest cartoon I've ever seen, but it certainly related to today's topic. And uh, the final slide is this one here. Uh, on, the, on the left, we have Conan Doyle um, at some kind of baseball event. Um, you can see he's kind of standing next to what I believe was probably home plate. Uh, it might have been a cricket bat in his hand, but with the, the plate or what looks like the plate in the ground, it's probably a baseball match. The middle picture is Conan Doyle in, uh, I believe, 1922 with his family, and the middle is Harry Houdini. The three kids, uh, once again, all are decked out in baseball gear. The boy on the left has a glove on, the boy in the middle, of course, is a catcher, and even uh, little Dame Jean here on the, on the bottom bottom right, you can just barely tell. It looks like she has a baseball glove on her hand. Um, and of course, uh, the Blue Jays logo, logo, go Jays, seven wins, six wins, seven losses, almost a 500 ball. All right, I'll hand it back to Greg. Thank you, Mark, that was very enjoyable, even with the Blue Jays reference there. Um, <laughs> If anyone has a question, just type the word Q, the letter Q into the chat and I will call on you and then ask you to unmute. So does anyone have any questions for Mark? Mark?
Mark, you covered the topic so thoroughly. I, I guess so. It, it's not a well-known topic, so I think I've uh, milked all the juice out of this one. There's uh, not much more to go on. Uh, Ross mentioned uh, setting up a, uh, a cricket team, but uh, maybe we should uh, think about a, a baseball team for uh, Sherlockians because Conan Doyle loved baseball and he thought it was actually a better sport than cricket. And I think a lot more of us would uh, have some experience with it as well. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Go for it, Karen. So back when I was getting into cricket around the turn of the millennium, all my uh, Australian and British uh, cricket-loving friends uh, mocked this uh, game that we play on our side of the pond, which they refer to as rounders, um, which I guess is their like school version of something baseball-ish. So was there anything like that as far back as Conan Doyle? Because here he is advocating baseball, and, and you didn't mention this rounders, so I didn't know. Yeah, rounders is definitely a uh, precursor to baseball. Uh, anyone who knows the, uh, well, the, the history of baseball knows uh, rounders is, is basically an early version of baseball. He probably would have seen it uh, in England. Uh, but it wasn't really set up the same as baseball, but it, it was a precursor. They probably did know of it, for, for sure. Uh, especially someone as active as uh, I, I, I looked it up in my Stonyhurst uh, connections, and I couldn't find any reference to uh, rounders at Stonyhurst. They, they were primarily cricket and rugby at Stonyhurst, and a lot of cricket. All right. Huh. Um, Nancy Holder had a question. Nancy, unmute and ask, please. Um, I don't remember if it was baseball. It was some kind of sport, but didn't he say something like, it's so weird that the players come from all over and, and they don't play for their home team or their hometowns and that they're paid, they're, they're sort of like mercenaries? Am I imagining this? No, no. Um... There's, there, there is more research, and, and my, my article that I, I wrote goes into other parts of the, this topic. Uh, he, he did uh, mention it, uh, and he did basically call them mercenaries, and he was quite surprised at the, the high salaries uh, they got. Um, one thing about Conan Doyle, as, as I mentioned, is uh, Dame Jean, one of them to be remembered as an all-rounder, he was a very strong supporter of amateur athletics amateur sports of every type and amateur athletics. And when, you know, he, he knew that when he, when he went to the polo grounds and he saw 10, you know, 10, 20,000 people there uh, watch, watch a ball game, he knew they were professionals and he knew they were from all over. And yeah, he, he had some thoughts on the, the professional game, how much they were play, paid, and they were getting paid a lot of money to play for him just a fun game. So you're, you're not wrong. He, uh, he had some other thoughts on baseball too. And uh, it's, it shows his love for amateur athletics. We'll put it that way. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Ross Davies, did you have a question? Oh. Yes, I did, Greg. I still do. Feel free to ask. All righty. Uh, Mark, uh, from, from the way you, you portray Conan Doyle talking about the benefits of baseball, mm -hmm. it sounds like the, the modern form of, you know, the modern T20 form of cricket, which tends to make for a two or three hour game, might be something he would have enjoyed, but I'm not sure because you're all, you also talk about the sort of traditional values in terms of sports, what we call traditional values in terms of amateurism and sports. Mm -hmm. How would he have felt about a change in or a variation in cricket that would make for a kind of cricket that was more like baseball or would he have preferred to keep the two sort of separate? Uh, I, well, okay. Uh, I think he, he would have been happy if they were both played. Uh, and he would have played both himself, given the opportunity, and he would have uh, preferred his sons to have played both. Uh, his, his sons really didn't follow up on his, uh, his hope of bringing, bringing and, and evangelizing uh, uh, cricket there. I, I think Conanoa really would have appreciated uh, shorter matches. He, uh, 
he he played a lot of cricket. There was a lot of uh, a lot of hours spent cricketing, and he, you know he his uh, his honeymoon his first honeymoon was spent cricketing. Uh, so he he loved the sport, but he does mention uh, several times how long the matches go, and especially uh, if if someone's trying to for a century. They're about a long time. The other guys are just standing around kind of watching. And that's one thing he liked about baseball is you didn't have that happening. Um, now, you know, they they go in, field, in and out, but uh, not nearly as long as baseball, uh, as cricket. So I think, uh, I think Ross, you're, you're right. He, he would prefer a shorter game. Um, and that's one of the reasons he, he liked baseball. Two, three hours, it's done. You've had your hot dog. You've gone home already. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Mark. We have a last question from Charles Shaw. Charles, can you unmute and ask your question, please? Hi, thank you. Um, first off, amazing presentation. Very informative. I had no idea of the connection between baseball and Doyle. My question is real quick. What was Doyle's favorite aspects of baseball compared to cricket and what would Sherlock Holmes enjoyed baseball as well as Doyle did? Sherlock Holmes would not have enjoyed baseball. He was, you know, all, all this really all the sports mentioned uh, that Holmes are, are singles, single sports, boxing, single stick. You know, he's he's a one man kind of sport, not a team sport uh, character. Uh, Watson probably would have given a shot at at anything. He was, uh, you know, he. Rugby and, and, and cricket. Um, there, there was there's a lot of aspects. I think I think Conan Doyle it, it liked for for baseball. Um, he thought at, at some level, I think he felt the skill level was higher in baseball than in a lot of cricket, and I think he appreciated that. Um, he. Of course, a lot of what he saw was professional baseball, and what he played was amateur cricket, uh, although at a very high high level at times. So I, I think there's a, a leveling of the field, so to speak, that we have to realize. But he uh, he did like a lot of the skills needed in baseball, and I think he saw them uh, as complementary skills uh, to cricket, his first love and what he played most of his life. Uh, he didn't. He didn't play cricket all of his life. He um, he took a ball on the knee and uh, in, in his fifties, I believe, and uh, that was kind of the end of his cricketing career. But he, I, I think he saw baseball as a really great sport for a lot of people. Thank you for that question, Charles, and thank you to Mark for this excellent presentation. Oh, thanks. Um, by the way, very nice lapel pin you have on there. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Doing Baltimore proud. Definitely. Thank you again. And with that, it is time to go on to our um, story discussion on his last bow. Dr. Bob Katz is going to be leading the discussion there. So, Bob, if you can unmute. Good. I think I'm on. I think I'm unmuted. Good. Great. Thanks to Greg for inviting me. Um, I have the daunting task of 